today we've got some special guests here. I'm going to have Skyped in from, I think you guys are in Newcastle, aren't you? Yeah. But, but just to get you in the mood, I just want to play a little clip. So today I'm really pleased to have um, uh, Anne and Roman Rekowitz uh, to speak to you today. I met Anne um, down in Paracon in Katoomba uh, last year. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good, good, good. Okay. And Anne was giving a presentation about um, uh, what I, something I found really interesting was about um, doing paranormal investigations with table tipping and all sorts of other unusual things. And I know Anne has a particular interest in the Victorian era of the paranormal and that's why I played you that clip. So um, Anne's here today with her husband Roman. The mic? Yeah. What? Yeah, you need the mic? Yeah. Okay, all right, sorry. I'll just give it a bit. Anne's here today with her husband Roman who I believe has a background in engineering. Is that right, Raymond? Yeah, or electrical engineering. Electrical engineering. engineering right. Radio. Right. And Anne has a background um, as a music teacher. So would you please welcome Anne and Roman? <laughs> Great to have you here. Thanks for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate that. Oh, it's um, our absolute thrill to be here. Yeah. Now everyone has a story to tell. Can you tell us how you got involved in all of this work and, and actually what it is that you do? Um, all right, well, I've, I've had an interest in the paranormal for quite some time, from about the age of three, really, when I had strange things happening at my grandparents' house. Um, I feel the bed move and I remember seeing a dark shadow shoot out from underneath the bed and out the window. And I used to call it the hook at naughty. Um, which is a strange thing to be under your bed, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> when you uh, um, sort of look back at the land my grandparents on, they're actually on Aboriginal land. So um, we think that may have been some sort of Aboriginal spirit. But even going through high school, I found that the kids were all delving into the supernatural stuff and having seances. And I would keep saying, what if one of us has the ability? What if we bring something through we can't control? So even right back then, I was, I had this awareness that you had to respect what was going on without knowledge. Uh, so eventually, um, I joined a group in Hamilton uh, that was sort of like a spiritualist church, but not really. And that was when I was about 20, which was only two years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I, I did some work with them and they taught us about channeling and uh, spirits and crystals and all that sort of stuff. Then walked away from that for a while to have children follow Korea for a bit and came back to paranormal investigation probably about 80-ish years ago uh, where I saw things on TV with people with gadgets that would flash and go bip to detect spirits and I thought, wow. You can actually do something like that, and because uh, I, I felt I had the psychic ability of a brick, so <laughs> to be able to detect spirits using that sort of equipment is what brought me back into the field. So I joined up with a um, a lady who was starting off a paranormal team and um, started along there, and now we've moved on to other teams, other experiences, and eventually the current one, which is. Oz Paratech. Mm, okay, that sounds very interesting. What about you, Roman? How did you get involved in this? Basically through her. <laughs> um, I've probably had a few experiences looking back that I really couldn't explain. 
uh, through childhood and, and early teenage years, but pretty much ignored and wiped them and said, well, that I didn't have that because it can't happen. Um, but I'm also a skeptic and I'm, I've really acted as sort of the technical skeptic for the various groups that Anne's been involved with. If we had a problem, we'd, we'd go to him and say, can you give us a logical explanation for what's happening? Yeah. So skeptic, skeptic being on the side of, I'd like to believe it's true, but I need to see things rather than an unbeliever on one hand and a, um, and a believer in everything on the other hand. Mm. That must create some interesting discussions between the two of you. It does. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually a good yeah. yin and yang. It because, is. Yeah, um, the, the people who believe without questioning, um, <coughs> to try and find that logical explanation for them, it's, it's difficult for them, to get them to embrace that. So yeah. it's almost a, um, a shaming or an embarrassment to them if you try to explain that you know exactly what's going on mm. and you can recreate it probably yeah. for them. Yeah, and it is disappointing for them too. I know that with the UFO subject too. You tell them, yeah. no, it's actually, you know, X, Y, Z. Oh, really? <laughs> they're, really they're very passionate and they want to believe. Yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. So, say so you're investigating the paranormal. What are your criteria to decide what you're actually, uh, or when you're actually dealing with the spirit realm? What, what are you sort of, what's your tick list? I notice he's looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so if we have someone come to us with some sort of paranormal issue, uh, I like to talk to them outside of the environment first, meet in a coffee shop so they get to know what we're like. Mm -hmm. um, and then I find out what their issues are. Then if we are thinking that there's not logical explanations, then we will go for a walk through the house to see what is happening there. Uh, when we are doing that, we are taking note of what is in the house, what is around us, possible logical explanations. We ask very personal questions. Are uh, you on medications? Do you have disharmony in the household at the moment? Uh, and then we will go in to investigate if we think there is a need from there. To work out whether it's spirit or not, we have to try and eliminate every logical reason for things happening and when we are left with no possible reason then we will say this could be something to do with spirit or if we are getting intelligent responses to the questions we are asking using our equipment then we will say well this possibly is interaction with the other side mm. I'm very much along the same lines. I, if I can explain something, provide a reason for it, reproduce it possibly, then we're starting to get pretty doubtful. But if you start to exhaust everything you know of, everything you can think of that could cause it, then it starts to get interesting. Mm. Have you found, just thinking of some cases that I'm aware of, that they've found things like um, that people have been living above watercourses or certain types of rocks or those sorts of things. Have you found anything like that, anything unusual, something that they, other people would never have thought of that could explain um, their experiences? We've, we had one that was living above a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they could explain a few um, knockings. <laughs> um, look, in all honesty, most of the cases we've dealt with, um, has either been high EMF, so electromagnetic field, which uh, that in itself causes issues. It causes feeling of anxiety, nausea, headaches, um, paranoia. Um, you know, lights, light and electric fields and magnetic fields mm. have an effect, have a biological effect on people. Mm. And the other thing we deal with most of, uh, which has made me back away from private cases personally, is mental health issues. Mm. We're just not, we're not qualified to deal with that. I've done a mental health first aid course, um, but you have to look after your team members and the people you're working with as well. Mm. You can't, yeah, you can't G them up and go barreling in if it's obvious that they've got issues that yeah. they're dealing with that are inside their, their own minds rather than something with the house or, or something spiritual possibly going on. Yeah. Because yeah. You, potentially you can make their issues much worse. Yeah. 
So you touch briefly on the types of things that you are looking for. What questions do you ask them? Um, is there a particular way of asking your set of questions? Very delicately. As <laughs> <laughs> talking about the living or the dead. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll both actually. We'll get onto the dead. Yeah, but um, well, yeah, let's go on. The living. We, yeah. we had a questionnaire um, mm. which we would sit down with them, and the questions would be there, and that would help guide the conversation. Um, so we're not in your face going, so what drugs are you on and what mental health yeah. do you have? <laughs> so try to do it a little bit more subtly than that. Yes. Um, but there's still, in the end, you still need to ask those questions because as, as soon as certain classes of drugs are involved, it's, even if they're yeah. prescription, yeah, just like you've got all sorts yeah. of biochemical issues that are going on in people's brains. Yeah, exactly. And we, we're learning more and more about that as the years go on. Yeah. And it's not saying that um, people with mental health issues, it's obviously not having paranormal problems. Maybe they're the gateway to have the uh, ability to talk to the other side. Yes, exactly. Well, I was going to sort of switch track tracks on that because I, I wanted to ask you, um, what are your thoughts on perhaps some of these paranormal experiences that occur that are actually originating from the people themselves? Like there's theories about poltergeist activity and they're often you know, around uh, a teenager for example, who yeah. supposedly has a lot of emotional energy, well, I say supposedly, we know they have a lot of emotional energy, but um, yes. and I think you call that <laughs> kinetic energy, isn't it? Is that what it's it is? It's like a kinetic, it's a, yeah. a, a PK, yeah. they call it. Uh, and it's not just teenagers, it can also be uh, in situations where there is a lot of anxiety in the or household, stress, stress mm. Um, mm. relationship breakups, mm. fighting, um, maybe drug abuse. Or maybe, uh, maybe childhood abuse issues that are just coming back up again as people yeah. get a little bit older. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. and, and the, the thought is that it can possibly be the people themselves causing their own issues. And mm. I, like I know for a fact I'm my, my own worst enemy many times uh, with my own fears and uh, anxieties that I stop myself doing things. Mm. Um, it's quite possible that uh, people living in an environment that's causing them Anxiety mm. can create their own equitable. I'm I'm really on the fence with that as to whether any of these stuff that we're seeing that appears to be supernatural or spiritual, mm. whether that is being caused by somebody who existed and their mm. body just died and their spirit's gone on, or whether it's being created by the people sitting there or in that environment with the memories of that person of their life with that person and they they could be creating the, the issues. I mean if somebody's if somebody's body is gone and their spirit is still capable of creating those issues, why not a person who's still in their body mm. being able to do the same things? Mm. If you accept one, I think you've got to accept the other as and a possibility. Don't forget parallel dimensions. Mm. <laughs> and that as well, just to throw that into the mix. Yes, we'll get on to that more later. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask you how you choose your locations for paranormal investigations. I know that you actually, you actively pursue those investigations. How, how do you choose that? How do we choose it? Um, anywhere that will let us in. Okay, uh, yeah. It's uh, usually somewhere where there has been a lot of people through. There has been conflict or high levels of anxiety or challenges that people have experienced, hospitals, places like cemeteries, I really don't know why you would expect to see much paranormal activity there. But I think the beginner starts off in cemeteries because it's an accessible place to be able to get to and, and experience the spooky side of things. Um, yeah, I, we choose a location, I think, um, because of what the public would like to have an experience in like normal uh, the private cases we you know, obviously don't take, take public in and with some of my other teams we've investigated locations that have asked us to remain um, quiet about keep what, it anonymous yeah keep it anonymous and we've been at some amazing locations with amazing evidence that we would like to share but <laughs> we respect what they're they're asking us to do coming back to one of your earlier questions I think the basic the basic tenet, whether it's people who are alive or dead, is you treat them with the respect you'd expect to be treated by. And 
that sort of applied to all the groups that Anne's been involved with and everything that I've been involved with mm -hmm. as well. You don't walk in demanding and yelling and carrying on. Just treat them the way you like to be treated. Yeah. Are there any instances where you're convinced, without a doubt, uh, that you've come across something where you're actually communicating with something external to that's not in this from this realm, put it that way. And I know that's a, a, a trick question in a way, you know, because I know <laughs> Anne's told me a personal story which I'll ask her to share but uh, later, but, um, you know, what about you, Roman, you being the civil engineer there? Well, electrical engineer, but yeah. Oh, no, sorry, there's... electrical. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to go across one of my bridges, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, there have been a few things that I'm still wondering about, but my approach is still with what we're learning, and, and we're just learning so much about human beings, what the brain can do, quantum mechanics, the weird things that can start to happen in, in that, in terms of action at a distance and all that sort of thing, which makes mm. psychokinesis and all those sorts of things totally possible. Um, yeah, look, there are a few things. Um, one of them would be Monte Cristo, and brought back a photo from there, and we went back there for my son's graduation from the army training, and visited a few weeks later. And the only explanation I can come up for, for this photo is that what she's captured looking down one side of a room is what would be like a three-dimensional extrusion of a portrait that's on the wall that you can't actually see the painting mm. you're looking past it but if the people were actually sitting there where the painting is it's because like the that people painting came out of the painting to life yeah. the outline yeah, okay. that you can see is their hands and their frills and the chins and legs and everything and the, the dresses I've had, a, I've had a couple of experiences where i would say that uh, i i'm pretty sure i've been interacting with something not of this realm. Uh, one was at Quarantine Station Manly, where we were using the SLS X Cam, which is invented by Bill Chappell. It uses um, a grid of lights um, thrown out onto the wall in front of you, um, and if anything crosses that grid mm. of lights, it will map it, yeah. and they generally turn up as, as stick figures. So if you watch Ghost Adventures, you could have seen that camera yeah, in I've use. Seen it. Yeah. Uh, we had a medium tell us a couple of weeks before there was a child in this cupboard. We opened up the cupboard, we used the camera in there, and sure enough, a small figure appeared in the cupboard. We asked the figure, could they raise their hands above their head? And sure enough, both hands went up. Mm. So, can you wave to us? One arm went up and went like that. So to me, that was an intelligent interaction with something that I couldn't see, but was mapping with the technology we were using. Mm, fascinating. And the figure that you saw, what was it uh, well defined or was it sort of a... No, it maps as a stick figure. Oh, a stick figure, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's technology that's been borrowed and adapted from the Xbox system. Oh, okay. From the so, yeah. Connect. The right. Connect. Um, so it uses infrared and ultrasound to basically, what's supposed to happen is they pick up the motion of the players playing the Xbox game. Mm, yeah. um, and what we're picking up with the SLX X cam is the motion of something that we can't see, but the system is actually picking it up. So it's mapping it. Oh, I see. What you mean. Yeah, yeah, right. Interesting, yeah. huh? Yeah. Mm. And have you, um, how much How much of, um, I guess, hard evidence or evidence like that have you sort of, you know, out of all the cases that you've done, how much evidence like that have you gathered? I have got one photograph that I cannot explain. It's not like you get a lot of stuff. Um, one photograph. Um, I have countless EVP, so electronic voice phenomena. My very first one said, um, I was in the, the graveyard, so I was just starting out. Up the top by myself, I had two other ladies with me right down the very bottom of the field. And um, I said, is there anyone that would like to communicate with us? And this voice, male voice, which I didn't hear at the time, said, we're watching you. Mm -hmm. So that, I'm glad I didn't hear it at the time. <laughs> I may have yeah. tailed it out of there. Oh, please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But EVP, some interesting conversations through the spirit boxes, which is SB7, SB11. Um, one particular female voice said, 
they're not supposed to hear us in a very British accent and another mm. female responding going, silence. Mm. The interesting, uh, if people aren't aware of how the spirit boxes work, they're fundamentally radio scanners, very fast radio scanners. So they will just flip through a radio channel every tenth of a second or hundredth of a second. So if you come up with something intelligible coming out of that, um, that speaker, it would have to have been across maybe 10, 20, 50 radio channels. And yeah, some of the things I've heard on there really piqued my interest because they are the same, literally the same voice, the same tone of voice, the same volume over maybe three seconds, four seconds worth of audio. And this is this has covered half the radio band during that time. So the statistical chances of that actually picking that up are so very, very small that it, it's very interesting. Mm, mm, fascinating. Um, now, is there one particular experience for each of you that's actually made the hair on the back of your neck stand up? No. <laughs> Yours is... Um, you, isn't it? Yeah, the um, the only place I've really found, if Anne's describing herself as probably having the psychic ability of a brick, I'm about the size of a concrete block. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, yeah, quarantine station, I, uh, I was helping out with a tour one Saturday night that Anne was running. And with Rob. With Rob. Yeah. And I was um, walked into the room that everyone says, is the most haunted one in the Grave Diggers Cottage. And it, I just felt really odd all of a sudden. And was it something poked me? Yeah, broken by the ankle or something? Yeah, like that? yeah. And, uh, not, I'm not one to run and scream, but <laughs> sort of really had a, a good look around and there was nothing there that I could have stepped into. I wasn't moving at the time, I was just standing still. So yeah, that that literally raised the uh, raised the hairs on the back of my neck. Mm. That that same cottage at Quarantine Station, um, uh, we've had a very unusual EMF fields in there. That uh, at the time the cottage had no power to it. Um, I was also grabbed on the back of the leg uh, while I was filming, and when I pulled up the back of my trouser leg, you can actually see the the finger marks where I've been bruised into my leg. I, I think the scariest thing, though, that makes my hackles get raised is when somebody gets jumped by something, mm. and you look into their eyes and they're not there anymore. That is very scary. Or something else is there. Yes. Yeah. You mean looking back at it. you mean something's taken them over, or what do you? Yeah. Mean? Yeah. yeah. So, how did, oh, well, tell us more about that. <laughs> uh, uh, we've had a couple. We want to hear that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Notably, Rob was probably one of the, the um, memorable ones at Quarantine Station. We do love mm. Quarantine Station. Um, he felt called to the other end of a building at Asiatics and he wandered off. And I noticed he wandered off. And I sort of called out to him and said, Rob, come back. And he, he came back and he was sort of hunched over, his head was down. And I said, Rob, are you OK? And he's not responding to me. And um, grabbed, grabbed his arm and said, Rob, and he looked up and his eyes were blank and he started to go <sighs> and I'm going, okay, something's <laughs> going on here. So that's, I, I tend to grab their hands and both hands and look into their eyes and say, okay, Rob, come back to me now. Rob, come back. Um, and to try and get them back to their attention and if worse comes to worse, get into that, that hit, hit the thorn, there, yeah. down into there to try and um, get them to come back and then they'll, they'll come back and they sort of like, what what happened? I said, I rem he remembered going, walking away, but doesn't remember about five minutes after that. He just disappeared. Mm, okay. and as far as we know, he's never had epilepsy issues or no. anything like that. So no. again, there's sort of all questions that you need to yeah, ask and be aware of with people. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have diabetes these days and if they're having a, you know, a, a hypo or hyper or whatever it is, um, they can go yeah. into those sort of strange states too. I yeah, guess it's, yeah, important, exactly. it's, yeah, it's important to have a bit of a knowledge about that, about you know, first aid yeah. knowledge and knowledge about particular illnesses too. 
And late, late night investigations and overnight investigations are particularly good at getting that out of people. If they've got a weakness <laughs> and they've been they get to eight, hours, eight yes. hours without food and they haven't bothered drinking yeah. and they get dehydrated and they get low blood sugar and can quite literally fall over, yep. we'll start hallucinating. Exactly. Now, one of my favourite subjects in the paranormal uh, are Peak and Darien experiences. Have you guys, you know, where people interact with uh, someone and they later learn that that person died a couple of weeks previously to their interaction with them. Have you ever had any, investigated any cases like that? Um, possibly. Uh, one night when we were table tipping with some friends and Roman wasn't involved in this one. Um, we had someone come onto the table who seemed to be quite frantic and uh, um, was very erratic with the way the table was moving and uh, spelt out the name Francis, which happened to be a, um, a sort of an auntie of mine. Um, and we knew she'd been sick with cancer and our rule is if you're on the table and something comes through for you, you take your hands off the table. Um, and we know she had a lot of unfinished business, this particular lady, um, and she wanted to get a message to my dad and she actually spelled out his name as well. Uh, and so I was off the table, so I couldn't influence it. Um, and then she seemed to be calmer once she got the message to me to give it to my father. And um, I still, I tried to find out whether she passed away or not, but I know that she had been very ill with cancer at that time and had tried to reach out to my father. Mm -hmm. So I think possibly that may have been that experience there. Okay, because people and Darian experiences are where, where people can actually shake that like in their same physical realm yeah. where they shake hands yeah. with them and all that sort of stuff and then they say so spoken to a few people that that we know that have had those experiences mm. Mm. um dave schrader being one of them that's what set him on the path to uh, yeah. uh to look into the supernatural and uh do we start this radio and all the other things he does mm. well there, I think there that was the interaction with his grandfather yeah. yeah, I've not actually had anything like that. Yeah, there is a lady who comes to these meetings. She's not here today, but she's had an experience like that, where she was walking down the stairs in her block of units and uh, met someone uh, and had a chat with her on the, in the, on the staircase, stairwell going down, and then later on was talking, oh, I bet so-and-so the other day. She says, well, you couldn't have because she died two months ago. You know, that sort of <laughs> no, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I find that fascinating, you know, that, that, that and I, I wonder, you know, what's the... Because I'm a bit of a... I like to understand the science beside, behind these things and I wonder what's the physics behind that that can actually make that occur? Some sort of projection, although you, what's the, the particle that, that you were talking about that you oh, them and... Yeah, well, I don't know how many people sort of, probably very few would be keeping up with what's going on in the, um, in the physics world, but there's something they've been messing with for probably 10 years now and they're really, really certain that they've got it right and it was something that um, Einstein predicted as a sort of just before the gravity wave stuff came to the fore something he predicted a hundred years ago or so that he discarded because he thought this is too stupid it's just it couldn't be real so um, I'll introduce just a, a fudge figure into the equation to get rid of it and what it basically is if you create two particles, like a pair of electrons together, they're automatically locked into two different states. You can't have two of them doing the same thing in the same space at the same time. So if one of them's got uh, a spin in one direction, the other will have a spin in the other direction. If you then separate those by hundreds of kilometres and then measure one of them, what you can see is the other one immediately adopts the other state to the one you just measured long before light could possibly, which is the, only, the fastest thing we know of, before light could possibly have gone from one spot to another. So there's no field, there's no energy, there's nothing that can actually travel in three dimensions that could make that happen. So I mean, it's still one of the, a bit of a mystery, but they're absolutely certain it does happen. 
and looking for explanations now. So mm. once we've got that sort of thing, mm. it's possible to be maybe that that energy from one person may be here and and have passed, but the energy is possibly still, still somewhere pretty much else. intact somewhere else. Yeah. yeah, and could possibly reappear. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, and you, before you touched on table tipping, can you run us through a table tipping event and explain what it is and how it works and what do you do? And okay, well, uh, basically uh, we were meeting in a group session once a week and uh, we were trying to communicate with the other side a bit along the lines of the skull experiments, uh, but we didn't have a great deal of knowledge. Uh, and I suggested possibly trying table tipping. So we did a bit of research on it, got a table, and it's basically a three-legged wooden table. Um, well, we've got one next to us here. Now, my room is full of three-legged wooden tables. Uh, <laughs> here we go. So you can see the, mm. that's just the three-legged wooden table there. And the don't, nice don't hit me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we do is we sit around the table, we place our fingers lightly on the table and we ask if there's any spirits uh, present, could they please come forward and tip the table? And we have had on many instances the table will tilt over to the side. Um, so I normally do it with around about four people. Um, I have found it works better if there is a medium on the table. Um, and we've even got uh, like full sentences information out by rocking through the alphabet. So you go A, B, C. If it stops on C, you know that letter is C, you make note of it. Go to the next letter and we'll get full sentences. Slow, but can be very interesting. Mm. Mm. Uh, Barry and I have tried that with, by ourselves and with another friend of ours. Haven't had anything happen yet, but um, put it aside yeah, for you, a while. You, You'll have to um, bear with it for a little while. It is something that takes a while to build the energy up. Uh, and, and again, simple simple respect, respectful questions, respectful invitation to, uh, to anything that's around that wants to communicate. And you also have to trust the people that you're working with, that ego is not involved. Um, and how do you know that somebody's not actually yeah. tipping the table themselves? Like when you've got people that say, oh, it always tips when I'm on the table, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you've got to be worried that ego is not involved there. Yeah, and unconscious tipping as well, I suppose, because you want to want it to happen. Yeah, mm. and I've got a few theories on why it happens when it when it really does happen, rather than somebody manipulating the table. And I've, it sort of starts to fall into the realm of the group producing something, as we were saying earlier, with the psychokinesis, that sort of thing, but. Possibly just synchronisation of heartbeats even, because every every moment your body has got very slight movements. Military are actually working on some really brilliant stuff for detecting people just yeah. from that, the sort of the old sci-fi movies where they could look through a wall, uh, literally getting that sort of stuff. But there are always minor motions, heartbeat, breathing, and if that starts to synchronise amongst the members of the group, there's nothing stopping that from then adding together in one direction rather than just happening randomly. Mm, mm. Although some of the movements and activity we've had on the table, <laughs> I don't see how that could possibly be. <laughs> Have you had any levitation off the table? That's our goal. That's what okay. we want. We keep asking, will they please levitate? But we've had yeah. it go up onto one leg and spin really quite quickly. Um, and we've had it walk like walk this across the, the table. We've chased it down the hallway once. <laughs> you chased it down the hallway, I've, really? I've got a gun barrel house here, or we've got a gun barrel house, and we've, <laughs> we've got our fingers on the table and we're chasing it down the hallway. <laughs> so we've tried, we've tried various things, um, thermal cameras to basically see what sort of imprint people are leaving on the table. Mm. One way where maybe it would be obvious if someone was manipulating it and putting force on it, they'd have a much brighter thermal image left on the table. And interestingly, we've been doing some work with Renata from Newcastle Ghost Tours. I think you may have met her as well. Um, we had the thermal camera on her for the world's greatest ghost hunt, which was a couple of weeks ago. Greatest. No, greatest? Okay. Uh, largest, largest. Oh, yeah. uh, it was countries, several countries around the world Five investigating at the one 
moment in time mm. doing the same yeah. thing at the same so time. So we had Renata on the table and she is the medium and the thermal camera was picking up everyone else's hands with the, the yellows and the, the reds. Hers were blue. Her hands mm. were blue. Mm. And she always says to us that she feels like spirit comes in, places their hands over hers and works through her that way. And to see that, well, that was really quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. And what you would expect if someone was actively using their hands would be to see increased Heat blood flow through them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, question. Yes, talk demons. Hey, how's it going? Uh, just a question in regards to setting boundaries. Um, you were saying that uh, what you say holds value to the spirits. Why do you think that? Like, why do you think that our word holds value to the spirits? Sorry, I, I heard about the setting boundaries and I couldn't quite because he's jiggling and stuff in my ear socket for a second, so I can hear. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, a while back you were talking about setting your boundaries, such as um, if you were going to communicate with the spirit, you would ask for a good spirit to come. Uh, and so, so you were saying that our word holds a value in the spirit world. Uh, why, why do you think that holds value? I'm not, I'm not really sure. I can only tell you um, about what we've tried and experienced and the results that we've got from that. Um, I have found that by removing permission at the end of the session, I've not had anything follow me home, I've not had any bad experiences in my own house, um, and I've always felt quite safe coming home. Um, we've, um, I, I think possibly more online with your question, we've had experiences where, uh, as, in the, um, as in the tape, basement experience with the table tipping where we seem to be talking to another group who are doing exactly the same thing just offset 40 years in 50 years in time um, there are there are some things that we've been doing with table tipping and and other uh, spirit communication sort of things where we seem to be talking to groups of people seem to be in the spirit realm if you want to look at it that way who are investigating, communicating with us in almost exactly the same way that we're trying to investigate, communicating with them. So I sort of feel like I'm, I, well, not me personally, but we've stumbled across possibly um, a, a rule, I, I don't know if that's the best way to put it, um, or a boundary that we can set, you know, we do not give you permission. Um, they even talk about the demonic permission, uh, possession that you have to give permission for them to be able to um, attach to you in some way or other. You might not do it openly, but you might accidentally do it. So I, I always say to the people at Quarantine Station at the end of the tour to remove your permission, to say thank you, but it seems to have worked. So it just seems to be something that I've stumbled across, we've stumbled across, and I'm using it with confidence and maybe it's just my confidence that, that makes it work. I'm not sure. Thank you very much. No worries. Yes. You got Is that, um, was that, uh, were either of those answers close to the question? <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, um, Just a, a comment um, about the permission. As what I've learned along the way is that we are very powerful beings ourselves. Yes. So. We are powerful, so what we say goes. We, if it, it concerns us, because everybody is their own power. And also, uh, when you were saying about other people doing it 40 years ago, and, and you doing it, and they're trying to communicate you, I've also learned that everything is happening now, you know, the parallel universes, and, but they're all happening now. That's why like, the aliens can, can be aliens from 300 years in the future can communicate with us because they're actually existing now because everything is happening now because this is the only moment we have now. We just don't, don't yes. understand how, we how the mechanics of it. Effect. Yeah, so there's no yeah. past. Uh, because we are in human form, the way we look at things is in a linear form, past, present, future, but actually everything is, is happening now, there is no past, our past is happening now, our future is happening now, and now it's now. So um, I think that's one of the things that, one of the explanations that I can 
think of. Yeah. 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 Like, like what you said at the beginning about um, we are very powerful beings. We are. If, if you accept the idea that we're dealing with spirit leftovers of people who have lived already, why would you not immediately assume that you're at least equivalent to them, if not more powerful, because you still have a body to work with? Don't know. I think it's a conditioning in this lifetime is we we are told that we are not good enough and we are not powerful. That's why we tend to think that we are not. Yeah. Yeah. And anything we don't understand is for safety's sake, you would assume for survival's sake, you would assume anything you don't understand is a threat and is potentially more powerful than you until you understand what it is. And then almost always it becomes a oh okay, that's all it was. And, and what it, you mentioned before briefly about time slip experiences, um, where uh, or you were saying perhaps your experience with the forty years difference in your in you doing the table tipping in the other group. I mean, I, you've got to wonder how that works. But you must have heard of Rex Gilroy, who's reported on, or you might have reported on some time slip experiences where people report coming upon scenes from, you know, 100 or 200 or 400 years ago. Um, have you had anything to do with those sort of experiences? No, I haven't. Uh, but I have read about them where they, they suddenly feel that they've been from this moment and they've, they're Some in another moment. They're all of a sudden a different scene around them and and it's gone again. So, no, I I don't, but... It's, the same physical place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At, at time gone by, yeah. Or people who appear. They have experienced that. Yeah, or people who appear dressed in uh, Victorian style clothes, and then they're gone. They're there one minute and gone the next. That sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what you you mentioned before, demons and what that about de everyone? You know, people do tend to demonise things. But what's your experience with that, and how do you? What's your perspective on that? Um. It goes back to my thing I was saying before that if you're a dickhead in life and had the chance to misbehave in death you'd, you'd, and muck around with people's um, emotions, you'd have the chance to do that and prey on people's fear of what they perceive to be a demon and put that fear in front of them, then they're, they're going to feed from that. Now, I'm not saying that demons don't exist. I'm just thinking that they're nowhere near as prevalent as what American TV makes them out to be. Um, I think if we came to a location that had a demon in it, that we would have liquefied bowels immediately. <laughs> um, but they also talk about uh, that there are different types of demons, that there are some that aren't necessarily all evil. because. You've got to look at the word demonic from the religious viewpoint or from um, the not religious viewpoint. So it's, it's the other team. Yeah. So it's the enemy. And um, they could well be just as nice a bunch of people as us. Yeah, I, I've not come across anything demonic in the time I've been doing this. Um, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I have very limited experience um, to the whole world out there of what is possibly demonic. But I think a lot of things are attributed to being demonic when they're not. What is a demon? What is, is it exactly, in your understanding? A lower, a lower vibrational being, supposedly, is some of the uh, descriptions I've heard, or um, elemental in nature rather than not it never being of human form. Um, well, never, never, not being developed from, from animals or sentient living beings, something or that's formed. The opposite of an angel is a demon, so that's more in the religious sort of thing. Mm. Mm. Well, that definition is always a good thing to start from. And there yeah. Are many. <laughs> yeah, I think man kind of has more demons amongst them in their living in flesh than there are in the other yeah. side. Yeah, yeah. Thought. <laughs> Although I have heard some pretty yeah, scary from. stories from policemen. But you know, there's all yeah. sorts of things that people practice within the suburbs and maybe they shouldn't. And, you know, people, yeah. I've heard, um, and, and let's say, let, let me be specific here, we're talking stories, you know. Um, yes. So and unless you actually yeah. witness it firsthand and you're there yeah. to um, experience it, you don't really know what's happened. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to trump up a bit. No, we don't. <laughs> Oh, well, anyway, depends if they like white wine. Long way from not drinking heavily, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, a question. If somebody has lower vibratory fields hanging around them in the spiritual sense you call demons, and they go and do a, a Ouija board or something like that, they could sort of lend a voice to something that's already there as opposed to discovering, if that's making sense, so an aspect of self. Um, yeah, if, if, if they are of, um, if the person themselves is of a lower vibrational energy and uh, maybe dealing in uh, sort of using drugs or anything like that, then they are going to attract the lower level of the spiritual realm um, and they're not likely to take the precautions that you should take um, and be sensible about it. Like a lot of the stories you hear about Ouija boards. Um, are teenagers um, or they've been drinking, not that there's anything wrong with having a drink or two, I have no problems with that whatsoever, but don't go and try to communicate with the spirit realm when you're being on the night of the piss. Um, but I remember a really a good story that came from Mexico, they were saying this girl was possessed after using a Ouija board and then it turned out that she'd actually taken some sort of psychotic drug to open up her senses to the other side, but they were blaming the Ouija board for the possession, not the drugs that she'd taken. That, that potentially it permanently altered the brain yeah, chemistry. Yeah, yeah. So whether it was a spiritual attachment of a negative energy or whether the drugs had caused the issues and she thought she was possessed, mm. you don't know. Uh, yeah, I've, I've I've, 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 I feel around such matters for a while, but sorry. Sorry. I've often found the correlation between the personality that looks and what happens. And a lot of human beings are drama queens and, and drama oh, males, yes. whatever they are. And, and uh, they, um, they create things around them in order to attract attention or make themselves seem more interesting. Um, especially when you get to spirituality, everyone who has a, a predetermination to want to seem for greatness or be talking to God about this and that and then the angels visit them because they're special people and um, when you, when you take away the, the <laughs> equation <laughs> um, and, and that's one of the hardest things when I've been looking at things is to is to work to work your way through the person's ego especially when it comes to healing and matters like that um, the, the very often the practitioner is the patient yeah, ego is um, one of the biggest problems in the paranormal field. Uh, people will watch a lot of ghost adventures TV shows or, or ghost hunters and become an expert from watching the TV shows and yeah. um, they will be right and everyone else is wrong and declare themselves to be demonologists after doing a weekend course. Mm -hmm. um, and ego is such a huge problem. It's one of the things that I sort of regularly say as part of my mantra of working with the spirit realm is I, I will say please help me keep ego out of it and let me be of the best service to you. Be a bloody here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, ego is uh, all to do with creating fear in some form, even as to a small extent. They won't, is that they not won't true? hear that. They won't hear that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I just thought that uh, ego in many ways is about creating fear, um, just, just that exercising one's <laughs> power. He goes all about Don't fear. Don't you the microphone. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit averse to this. Um, I don't like hearing my voice echo in the background. Um, ego always is, to different degrees, creating a need or having a need to have power over others in a sense, even in a more subtle way. That's the way I view it. So you're creating fear in other people with ego. So the, yeah. the strongest ego. Like, hmm? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I'll have to learn. Have some practice. On We're that. just about out of time, but I wanted. I've got a question. I wanted to ask you about um, photography. Have you had anything to do with that? Where people are taking photographs, um, and perhaps some of those have got orbs, and in those orbs, images appear. I'm not talking about badly defined orbs. I'm talking about really specific images of face, of uh, people that that person knows or other people they know can identify in the orbs. And there's a really interesting case um, 
Oh, I'm just trying to think of a name. Can't remember a name. Anyway, um, but have you come across cases like that where, in, say, in certain photographs, and it happened in some of these skull, ex uh, skull experiments too, didn't yeah. it? Where, um, yeah. and I was wondering, is it the people who are um, who've put the film there in the lock, like, lead box on the table, and has it got something to do with them? Are they somehow involved with? you know, those ex um, images appearing on the film, or is it something external? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I, I do know what you're talking about, and it's actually something that we're going to be trying to hopefully do within our own circle, do some experimentation with that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, because some of those images that were on the film from the skull experiment weren't of, um, things that the people in the room would have known or seen, so it would have been hard for them to imprint it onto the film. Um, but once again, we don't know what the human mind is really capable of doing. We've only scratched the surface of what we're capable of. So it could be, or um, I always like to try to think that it's spirit that's working with us. I so want to believe that it's spirit. Um, I keep getting sadly dashed with human interaction and ego getting in the road. Um, don't know. <laughs> another, another thing that we do when we do have our circles is we usually start with 15 or 20 minutes worth of meditation of some sort. Try and still the mind. Still the mind, probably to get the ego out of the way as well. And, and just open the mind, clear the mind so that you're not actually switching off and discarding things you experience. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Well, look, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but I would really like to thank you guys for taking the time to spend the afternoon with us. If people no, want, it's been if, very enjoyable. Yes, <laughs> survived. <Yay. laughs> and if people want to buy any of the the gizmos and the gadgets that you have there, how do they do that? How do they get in touch with you and do that? Well, you can find us on Facebook as Oz Tech. Um, three separate words, or uh, on the internet, it's www.ozparatech.com. Great, all right. Well, thanks very much for, for spending this time with us. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs>